Marathon 130, thank you for joining me on the Dixie Cryptid channel. I really do appreciate you. I hope you enjoy this video. We've got four stories and they're all really good. All right, here we go. Before we get started with the stories, I want to make an announcement. First, let me tell you something. I have been in this YouTube thing for about two and a half years now. And in all this time, I've never been to a Bigfoot conference. And they've happened all around me or, you know, within at least 100 or 200 miles of where I live. And I've just never had time to do one. However, this summer... Uh, Nance Warren with Buckeye Bigfoot and I got together and she was asking me if I had ever been to one. Of course, I said no. So she invited my wife and I to join her and her husband to share a booth at the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference in Gatlinburg, Tennessee on, let's see when it is, July the 24th, the summer. That would be 2021, July 24, 2021. I think you have to buy tickets to it to get in. And I just wanted to let you guys know that we're just going to have a booth there with, hopefully I'll have a book, a Steve Lilly book published by then. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. I'm just slow. But uh, we'll have, you know, just some merchandise and things to sell you. But mainly, we want to be there and meet people who uh, actually listen to our channels and give you a hug and you know, as long as we're not spreading COVID germs by that time. And and even if we can't give you a hug, we'll just across the table, shake your hand or whatever. I don't know. But I would love to meet you guys there. And it would be uh, really fun. I think we're going to be there for a couple of days. And I can't wait to see Nance and talk to her and meet her husband and introduce her family to my family. And it should be a great time. So you guys take a look at that you can go to i don't know what the website is you can just look up smoky mountain bigfoot conference on google and you'll find it and i'll i'll try to find the link and put it in the description below but i just wanted to tell you that going to my first bigfoot conference going to be there for two days and uh don't come there to see me Come there so I can see you. I want to meet you. I want to talk to some of the folks and have some conversations and uh, get to know you. Take some pictures and share stories between each other. And I think they have a lot of great things going on. There's speakers. There's going to be all kind of vendor booths and things like that. So uh, if you've got time the week of July the 24th, try to make plans to be there. I'd love to see you there. Okay, let's move on with the video. Here's a story from Josh, and this, he says this is not a Bigfoot story, but it, I, I'm going to tell you what I think it is. I'll tell you one option that I think it is. This could be a dog man, but it's not as big as a dog man, so I don't know. But let's listen to the story, and at the end, I'll tell you what I think it is, if it's not a dog man. So here's what Josh writes. I've never seen a Bigfoot, but I did see something that I never expected. Back in 2001, I was a tanker serving in the 172nd Armored Regiment at Camp Casey, South Korea. I was living in a large concrete barracks with a smelly, unwashed roommate from hell. I always had the bad luck to constantly draw the short stick that left me with weekend guard duty or grass cutting duty. Time stands still on guard duty in the Army. In the motor pool, it's all tanks and ammo storage units full of, well, obviously, ammo for tanks. But as privates, it is our duty to guard them with our lives. Monotony reigns supreme. Vehicles are logged in as they came and went. And at night, one partner of the guard team would walk to the motor pool with an axe handle while the other sat in a shed or in a Humvee. It was almost too exciting for one heart to handle. For fun, I would torture myself with thoughts of my girlfriend back home who was, yes, cheating on me, or sometimes we would play pranks on each other. 
The war on terror had not yet begun. September 11th was still months away, and frankly, I was a bit homesick. I guess my favorite pastime was kicking myself for enlisting in the first place. Like I said, it wasn't uncommon for soldiers to prank each other. Doing things to scare one another, the nastier the better, was the next best thing to a letter from home. That's why I didn't think much about it when I first heard it. I've been walking the line of perfectly parked tanks, mentally drifting off to some place a lot more interesting than this, when I heard a strange sound. It was like high heels on the concrete. I stopped for a minute to listen, but I dismissed it as nothing. I started walking again, and as soon as I did, the tap, tap, tap started again. I stopped, and it stopped. My friend from the gate must have gotten bored, and I was about to be his entertainment. That's what I thought. I figured he was going to try to sneak up on me, and at the last minute, he was going to jump out and scare me. I started walking along the tank again, slowly this time. I was sure that he was on the other side. So as I neared the front, I rushed around and I said, Aha! I jumped out into what should have been his path. But he wasn't there. There was no one there. It was a little disturbing, but I brushed it off. All heck, I must be losing it, I told myself. I was about to resume my duty when I heard that strange tapping again. It was coming from under the tank. It sounded like a set of large nails clicking and sliding along the pavement. I reasoned that the only thing that could be making this sound was my guard duty partner's axe handle being dragged along the ground as he positioned himself to jump out and give me a good stare. Well, I wasn't about to give him the satisfaction. I decided I'd give him a whack he'd remember. So I grabbed my army flashlight and I got down on my hands and knees to confront the prankster. Those flashlights are big enough and heavy enough to be weapons in and of themselves, so I was pretty sure this was going to hurt a little. I lowered my head and yelled, Ha ha! My voice changing from victory to fear in mid-syllable. I whipped the flashlight at the space under the tank, pushing myself further backwards as I did so. I was trying to reconcile what I was seeing. It was a rat. A rat. A rat. It was just a rat, I kept saying to myself, but rats aren't that big. It had a disgusting rat face with beady eyes and yellow teeth, but it was so big. If it was a rat, it was the largest rat I had ever seen. If it was playing a game of cat and mouse with the cat, the cat would be the mouse and this thing would be the giant mutant ninja rat. It never even blinked when I threw the flashlight at it, and I'm pretty sure I hit it. What's more, this thing wasn't the least bit afraid of me. I screamed again as I heard those clicking claws moving towards me, and I scrambled to my feet and I ran for the gate, sure that this thing was in hot pursuit. I told my buddy what I saw, but he refused to go check it out. I knew I was going to have to go retrieve my flashlight, but nothing could force me to do it before our relief showed up the next morning. I told the people in my platoon the next day what I saw, but no one questioned it. They seemed to have no doubts that rats could get that big eating army trash. But I'm telling you, this was not a rat. Whatever it was, it didn't run, and it was not afraid of me. To this day, I can still see it staring at me from under that tank. The only animal I can find that's comparable to it is a capybara, a South American rodent that is so uncomfortably large. I left the Army, got a college education, and have a good career. Now that I'm nearing my 40s, I look back on my Army days with a smile. I even miss the jokes. But I would never want to run into that thing again. Sincerely, Josh. Uh, (laughs) That's a great story. And so... At the beginning, I thought that this may be a dog man or a small, maybe a small dog man or something. It sounds like some kind of weird creature, but we have these big rat looking things. They're about the size of a beaver down here in these swamps and waters in the South. And they're called a nutria. Some people, uh, their weight, they go all the way down to Louisiana. Matter of fact, I killed one years ago. I was uh, I was waist deep in water duck hunting and this thing was swimming up to me and man I mean it looked like a monster and I, I didn't know what to do so I killed it. 
the guy that owned the land said, I'm glad you killed it. You didn't do anything wrong. Those things tear up our levees and our fields, and I'm glad you killed it. But we drug it out, and this thing had a big old head on it, and it had the biggest orange teeth I've ever seen in my life. And man, if that, I don't know if they're mean. I don't, I've, this is the only one I've ever seen. I killed it. And I've seen them while I'm fishing down in Louisiana. I'll see them up on the banks down in the marshes and they just tear up the dirt. They just tear up all those marshes and stuff. And I don't know what they're doing, maybe digging for food, but it really was the ugliest big rat I have ever seen in my life. And I got to thinking, looking at those giant orange teeth. I mean, they were the size of a hammer claw and about twice as wide. And man, if he'd have dug those teeth into me, I'd have never got away from it. I don't, I don't know how I'd ever got away from it if he locked them in me. So it could have been a nutria, and uh, uh, a source is telling me that it's uh, they're pretty common in Korea. They're about two and a half long. They weigh about fifteen to twenty pounds, and I think people eat them there. So maybe Josh, what you saw was a nutria. Or you saw a little baby dog man. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just rambling on. Great story, though. I'm glad you sent it because it was really enjoyable. And the way you wrote it was really funny. I appreciate you, man. You got a good sense of humor. Thanks for sending it. Here's a story from Australia. And I, I've made so many nice acquaintances with folks way down there in Australia in the Southern Hemisphere where they have a beautiful accent, and they talk kind of like we do, but I don't know, it's quite different, but it's kind of the same. And uh, they appreciate a Southern accent for some reason. I don't know why. Everybody here in the United States makes fun of it. But the Australians seem to like it, which is odd to me. Angela is the writer. Here's what she says. I've recently discovered your videos, and though I'm not one to listen to a lot about Bigfoots or cryptids, I do have an interest. It's usually something that captures my attention in passing. But now that i found your videos, I find myself actively looking for them. I guess what I'm saying is, well done. Well, thank you. That said, I'm writing to tell you that my husband and I own 100 acres out in the bush of southern New South Wales. We're currently under the threat of fires, and this gives me concern for our wildlife and the yaoi that lives out there. My husband has seen him only once, but I have now come to understand that he has been around us this whole time. We have misunderstood signs. This I have learned over the last few weeks. It was only after sitting down and analyzing the information in these stories that the light bulb finally came on. I'm a 46-year-old ex-military female, and my husband is 50. He's an ex-policeman of 25 years. We have many interests, but we're not prone to telling stories. If anything, we keep a lot to ourselves. Our property is semi-off-grid, and we are not on it full-time. But when we've been there, we've had a lot of strange things occur. This event stuck in my mind due to my husband's reaction. At the time, he was at the farm by himself. This was not unusual for him. He would spend weeks down there gardening or fixing something. He came home and just blurted out that he saw a yowie. Then he immediately second-guessed himself, saying, No, no, it couldn't have been. It was someone in a yowie suit. Then he reversed himself again. No, it was too big. I knew if I'd wait a minute, he'd tell me a story. He was just out the front of our cottage, planning or working in or around the garden. It was a bright, sunny day, so we had a clear view of the fields and rocky slopes of the adjacent property when he stood up and turned around. There are two large properties near ours, divided by a rough dirt road. They're surrounded by cattle fencing, which is enough to impede a human. There are rocky outcrops here and there and fields and shrubs. A massive river runs through both the property next door and ours. My husband said he could feel something watching him. Over the years, as a policeman, he has learned to trust that feeling, so he stood up and he slowly looked around. Gradually, he turned in the direction of the field and the rocky slope, until he was facing our next-door neighbor's rocky outcrop, where the cow fence ran along the road. This giant, hairy creature easily stepped over the fence right in front of him. It stopped and looked at him for what he figured must be the second time and then continued walking. In fear, he turned to go back to the cottage. 
Then he turned back around to see where it went, but it was gone. It was just a few seconds and it was already gone. I asked him if he could describe it. He said he could see its features and they were like the classic Bigfoot. He was still arguing with himself. It must have been someone in a yaoi suit, he said. But that's not something you'd see in that area. And the main issue was it was just so big. The way it just casually stepped over that fence, it couldn't have been a man. Well, this is the end of his sighting. I have more to tell, but I'm currently using a mobile to write this message. And even though I've read through it a few times, I'm sure there will be issues. Anyway, keep up the good work. Angela, no issues at all. It's a great story. And I think the Yowie, the Australian Yowie, is real close to the American Bigfoot or the North American Bigfoot. Uh, they seem to be quite similar in appearance and physique and color. And I don't think anybody's going to be walking around New South Wales way out in the bush in a Yowie suit just for kicks. I really don't think that's going to happen. So this is a great encounter. I really appreciate it, Angela. Thank you. And I hope you all are doing well down in Australia. Here's an email from James, and here's what he writes. I've been fascinated by Bigfoot since the first time I saw one back in early 1970. I was 10 years old at the time and traveling with my mom and dad and four siblings to the northwest end of our reservation, roughly seven miles from our home. As we drove along, I saw Bigfoot walk across the road. Bigfoot, I shouted. There's a Bigfoot. We raced up to the spot where it had crossed about a quarter mile ahead of us and everyone got out of the car. I was a little scared, but I got out anyway. We looked for footprints, but we didn't find any. Ever since then, I've been studying about them, and that's how I found your show. By the way, I love this show. It helps because we have one or a few around our swamp house where we live now. Oh, that's cool, James. Thank I'm glad you like the channel. Thank you. After the first encounter, I went to the school library and I found a book about Bigfoot. It told the story of the Colorado man who was checking his traps and got carried away. What is ironic, at this time there was a song on the radio called Bigfoot's Coming to Get You, Going to Get You. You should play it. Years later, when I was in my early 20s, I had another encounter. I'd gotten my own place on the res about two blocks from my parents' place. One night, we'd run out of food and beer and decided to head over to my parents' place for a sandwich. It was about 2.30 in the morning, but we were young and hungry. It's like a small village here with trails that lead to everyone's houses, no cell phones and doors that don't need to be locked. The road I live on is dirt. We headed down that road surrounded by a balsam pine and then turned off onto a trail that would take us to my parents' back door. We got to the big pine behind their house when I began to hear the distinct snapping sound that sticks make when someone is walking through them. It was so dark I couldn't see my hand in front of me, but I could hear it getting closer, so I yelled out, Hey! It kept coming anyway, but it didn't respond. I gauged it to be 20 feet away when I let out another, Hey! My boy's mom dug her hands into my shoulders and whispered a pleading, Tubby into my ear. That's the nickname my dad gave me when I was two. It's never gone away. It kept approaching as fear crept over us. I doubled my fist and yelled, Hey, one last time. And it stopped about three feet in front of us. I pulled myself up to my full five, ten and a half height, knowing this thing, whatever it was, was about a foot beyond my outstretched hand. I could hear it breathing like an animal. It was barely visible in the dark, just standing there weaving back and forth. I could have leaned forward just a little bit and touched it if I wanted to. Time stood still as I wondered what was about to happen. What was it going to do? What were we going to do? And then it just turned and walked back in the direction from which it came. And just like that, it was gone. And then about two years ago, my uncle was giving me a ride home from my sister's place where we'd been playing the game of 10,000. It was pretty late at night as I was heading up the back porch when I saw a Bigfoot looking in my side window. I'm not really afraid of them when I know what I'm dealing with. They frequent this area too often for that. 
So I went inside and grabbed a bottle rocket out of my bedroom. I'm not sure what I was thinking. As I was doing this, it walked to my bedroom window. And just like in the movies, I could feel its steps rattling the windows. I quickly shut off the light and slid open the window. I pushed the bottle rocket through a tiny hole in the screen and I lit it. As soon as it went off, the Bigfoot headed off down the trail, hitting two sticks together as it went in the same five-beat pattern. I heard it repeat and tap, 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 all the way down the trail until it faded into the distance. Maybe it was warning others about the crazy guy with the bottle rocket. I really don't know. The next day, I went out to look for tracks, but just like when I was a kid, I didn't find any. I did pick up a pair of sticks that I judged to be about the same size as the one the Bigfoot had banged together the night before. I couldn't hit them together fast enough or hard enough to recreate that sound. I've had many encounters throughout the years. Sometimes I wonder if it's a spirit. I used to hunt a lot with my dad, and I'd see these five to seven inch diameter trees just snapped off. I wondered if it was males competing for females. I heard someone on your show mention that they're like us, some good, some bad. I believe that. By the way, I like the music you play on your show. I'm sorry I didn't proofread this better. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> There's another guy here who's also seen them a lot. I won't mention his name, but he and I have had some interesting talks. God bless James. Well, James, that's awesome. Did you say what reservation you live on? I don't even think you said what state you live in. I don't know. I'd have to go back and reread it. But I'm curious if this is uh, out in the American West. Is it in the Northwest? Or are you on a reservation down here in Mississippi? I'd be curious about that. But that's interesting. You're a native person and you, uh, you've had several Bigfoot encounters. And, you know, that just kind of fits. It just fits. I don't know. There's some kind of kins kinship between you guys and the, and the Bigfoots. It's, at least that's the way it's portrayed in folklore. So this is a great treat to get from a native person. And I really appreciate you sending it to me, James. It was a great story. Thank you, sir. Here's an email from Tom, and here's what he writes. I enjoy your channel. I listen to it all the time. There's a lot of great stories on it, which have inspired me to share some of my experiences. My name is Tom, and this happened in the winter of 1978 when I was 12 years old. It had snowed and they had closed the school that day. About eight of us kids, ranging in age from 12 to 15, decided that we were going to go squirrel hunting. We usually hunted along Hurricane Creek, just outside of Bryant, Arkansas, off the Cinemite, off, off of uh, Cinemide Road, I think that is. We'd had a foot of snow, but the ground was still warm. To get to the woods, we had to cross a ditch that emptied into the creek. We younger boys went first, and as I was crossing, I looked down and I saw a huge human-like footprint in the bottom of the ditch. There was another one just like it at the top of the bank. We also noticed that there were no birds singing that day, nor any squirrels barking, and the wood ducks that were normally there on the creek weren't there. The next day, with everyone still out of school because of the snow, we went into the woods by way of an old wagon road that was just wide enough for one car or truck to go down. We were headed towards the creek near an old Civil War battle site when about 100 to 150 yards in, one of the older boys remarked on how quiet the woods were. No sooner did he say that than we noticed a smell so rancid that it made my stomach turn. We knew something must be dead, so we started looking around to see what it was. We found a dead hog that must have weighed 200 to 250 pounds. Its head had been nearly ripped off its body. That wasn't what we were smelling, though. For one thing, this was a fresh kill. So fresh, there was still steam rising up off the blood coming from its body. We also noted that it wasn't a wild hog, either. We kept looking around for that smell, but now we were walking in a tighter pack, with the older boys on the outside and us younger ones on the inside, like cattle will do with their calves. Not far from where we found the hog, we found more of those same human-looking footprints we'd seen the day before, but this time in a patch of snow. They were heading towards that old Civil War battlefield. 
One of the boys said, we have a monster here, boys, just like they do in Falk, Arkansas. We figured that we'd scared it off shortly after it had killed the hog, so we decided we'd go in the opposite direction in case it wanted to come back and finish its meal. Funny thing, though, the wind changed direction on us, and we were heading out of the woods, and we got another whiff of that stomach-churning odor, this time coming from the direction of the hog but we already knew the hog wasn't the source of the smell. We were almost back to town when someone brought up the legend of Boggy Creek. I bet you it took that hog from somebody's pen, just like the Boggy Creek monster, somebody said. We'd all seen the movie and knew exactly which scene he was talking about. It was that thought, or thoughts like it, that probably kept us from ever hunting those parts again. Instead, we began hunting a stretch of woods near the railroad tracks. Those tracks ran about 20 feet above the tree line. They were built this way to keep them well above the swampy area of the woods they passed through. They also crossed over Hurricane Creek, about three quarters of a mile from where we found the first footprint. We'd been hunting this area for three weeks when about 11 of us, this time there were also three girls hunting with us, were heading down the tracks above the swampy area laughing and joking as kids will do and we all realized something was tracking us. We weren't sure at first so we tested it. When we would stop, it would stop. When we started walking again, it started walking with us. We couldn't see anything. It seemed just to stay beyond our line of sight. But now we were sure it was there. Furthermore, it was obviously something large and on two legs. We were almost to the bridge when the older boys told us that they were going to move to the other railroad track and fall back, and for us younger ones to keep going until we got to the railroad bridge. We were to stop there and get ready to shoot toward the noise. They were going to do the same. We stopped in a line like we were checking out the trees. Like before, it stopped too. Then the older boys came up on the tracks about 20 yards behind us and they started shooting. And we followed suit. Whatever it was started crashing through the thick brush and trees heading away from us in what sounded like a full run. After that, we decided it wasn't worth it to hunt on that side of Bryant at all. My two older brothers had their own experience with Bigfoot back around 1971. There was an old Bozite strip mine called Lost Lake south of Bryant. They would often camp in the spring of the year there when the nights were warm enough but the days weren't too hot. Back then, an old cougar they called Old Three Toes wandered that neck of the woods. Permanently maimed and getting old, it would often come into their camp and beg food off of them before bedding down next to the fire like some old camping buddy. Late one night, as my brothers and a few of their friends slept in their bedrolls while old Three Toes slept at their feet, they were awakened by a sound. Three Toes was facing into the darkness just beyond the tree line and growling at something no one else could see. In return, something in the tree line growled back in a deeper, more menacing matter. Three Toes turned tail and took off like he was scared of whatever that thing was. In a panic, the boys all grabbed their shotguns, something they never camped without, and fired into the darkness. The growling stopped and they heard something running in the direction of the water runoff from the lake. Once the sun came up, they all walked out into the woods where they'd shot, and they found pools of blood. They tracked the blood trail down to the runoff and found a large human-like footprint in the mud. It would be the last time any of them would camp in those woods. No three toes was just going to have to find some new camping buddies. I'm 54 now, and I still get shook up thinking about what was in the woods below those railroad tracks. I haven't ever really talked about these events until just recently. I live in the Arkansas River Valley now and have heard tree knocks in the small patch of woods on our property. It's mainly a jungle out there, but there's a game trail and we've had deer bed down in the thicket. The tree knocks started about five years ago and seem to occur mainly when my neighbor's chickens are ready for the market. Plus, we've seen red eye shine, something that I used to laugh at others for reporting. 
And about two months ago, I started hearing a bird call that sounds too loud and too low to be natural. I'd heard something similar to that up on Mount Magazine while deer hunting with my son. About three nights after hearing that, I let four of my dogs out around midnight to do their business. They ran straight to the corner of the fence where my shop and barn are and started barking like someone was out there. I grabbed my spotlight and I saw red eyes shine out by a tree limb and it lasted for about 30 seconds before seemingly it turned and walked back into the tree line. The next day I went out and measured from the ground to the limb. It was about 7 feet off the ground, so I'm guessing the creature must have been around 8 feet tall. And then about 10 months ago, while I was visiting my sister on the other side of the state, my wife called around 10 p.m. It was just a typical good night call before bedtime. She would call me while the dogs were out doing their business one last time before bed, and we'd talk a few minutes until they were done. But this night, when she opened the door to let them out, they all tucked their tails and ran to hide under her bed. She said she could smell something awful out there that could not be identified as a septic tank or a skunk or even a neighbor's chicken house. The next morning, she called and said the dogs finally went out later, but only after that smell was gone. Well, these are my experiences with Bigfoot. Thanks for letting me tell them, and thank you for the stories you tell on your channel. I hope to get my sister to ride in with some of her encounters, both at her house and as an over-the-road truck driver. Best regards, Tom. Man, that's a great story. Hurricane Creek, is that right there off 64 in the White River Bottoms, Tom? I think that's where you're talking about. I used to fish a little uh, White River Oxbow there called Hurricane Creek. It's right off 64, right outside of Bald Knob. We have a place over in uh, Heber Springs, Arkansas, and we'd bring a boat over there to trout fish. And if we were coming home on Sunday early enough, We'd pull down and in, get into Hurricane Lake and catch a brim all afternoon, and then we'd drive on to Memphis and end our weekend. It was always a fun thing. Matter of fact, I was talking to my brother about that yesterday and how much fun we had doing that. I'll tell you all a funny story. My dad was with us. He's dead now, but my dad was with us that time. And my, my oldest son and I, and he were in our boat. It was my boat. And my dad was working the motor, and he it's not a huge oxbow, and he motored us across the lake, and we got up in some trash, and it was June, and the brim were bedding down, and they were biting like crazy, and all you had to do was get way up in those trees and find the trashiest water you could find and swirl you out a little hole from all that trash floating on the water and drop a cricket in there, and we'd catch a, we'd catch a brim every time that cricket would hit the water. Well, it was so tight in there that my son and I, we were up in the front of the boat and we couldn't, you know, only the front of the boat would fit in these spots. And there's my dad sitting out in the middle of the lake and he is cussing us and man, y'all get me in there so I can catch some fish. And my son and I were just laughing and smiling at each other. Anyway, that was a good time. My brother and I talked about that. It's kind of a boring story, but it's a good memory of my dad. And he laughed about it when we left. We got home and he was telling everybody in the family, hell, I couldn't catch a fish. They kept me out in the middle of the lake all day. But we did catch a cooler full of brim and I'm just rambling on, I'll, sh I'll stop now. Thomas, thank you very much for sending this story. It was great. And there apparently are Bigfoot in Arkansas. Okay, buddy, thank you. Thanks for listening to Marathon 130. I really appreciate you and I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you'll join me on the next video. Thank you.